Welcome back everyone to part two of our winter webinar session. Thank you for being with us. May I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we meet on, pay my and our respects to Aboriginal elders past, present, present and emerging for those that have just joined us for part two. Just a note, and uh, this is my uh, and a note and an, and an apology. When I have mentioned the chat in the previous presentation, I noticed that this is attendees uh, chatting to or sending comments to the panelists. So sorry for any confusion, because I think the broader group won't be able to see this. But uh, in the last presentation, we certainly noticed, and Ed got lots of comments there. But of course, there is the Q and A function, which we'd encourage you to use for Cam's presentation. So may I introduce Cameron Francis. Cameron is a social worker with 20 years experience in the youth AOD sector. Cameron has worked in a number of different roles, including peer education at dance parties and music festivals, needle and syringe program work, individual counselling, and more recently in a role that involves training and complex case consultation. Cam is the National Operations Manager for The Loop Australia, and I know, Cam, you're going to touch on that and give a little outline of The Loop Australia and uh, the important work there. Uh, so thank you for joining us. It's great to have you with us. How would you like to do questions yourself? Uh, Scott, um, probably let's hold questions till the end, if that's okay. Um, so if you, if you want to uh, monitor them for us, if that's okay, and then um, uh, grab me some selections at the end. We should have some time. I'm pretty sure we get on time. So. Okay, great. Let's let's do that, and then I'll come back online, and we can uh, go through them together. Great. Thanks very much, Scott. Thanks for the introduction. Um, thank you, Varda, for the invitation to come and present today. Uh, so let's get into it. Um, before I go much further, I'd like to also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're all meeting on today. I'm broadcasting to you from uh, Brisbane, uh, which is Dribal and Yagara country up here in Queensland. Uh, so I want to acknowledge the traditional owners up here and also traditional owners for you guys in Victoria as well and pay uh, respects to elders past and present. So what I wanted to um, talk to you about today, firstly, I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of the Loop Australia and the work that we're doing and what we're up to. Um, and after that, I want to take you through uh, a bit of a story of novel psychoactive substances, as they're sometimes called. Uh, I'm not going to take you through every single substance. There are way too many of them. So what I want to do instead is I'm going to tell you a bit of a story about how these sort of these so-called novel psychoactive substances have emerged and what's the sort of drivers behind that. And I will go through a few key classes of those drugs and, and talk a bit about some of the effects and the risks and things like that. But I really want to focus on the drivers behind all of this because I think that's important for us to understand that this, this sort of pattern that we're in with increasing numbers of these new psychoactive substances, uh, this is not like a blip on the radar. This is sort of the future of drugs. This is how drugs are, are going to be with us um, and already are with us uh, in many ways as well. So firstly, I'll just give you a quick overview of the Loop Australia. So we are a volunteer based service um, and we have got teams operating in uh, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane. So we've got three states represented. Uh, most of us work in either AOD or the health sector or um, research area, that sort of thing. We're already working somehow in this kind of sector. Uh, and so we have uh, been together since about 2018 is when we all got together to try and develop a, a, an organisation to deliver drug checking here in Australia when the time is right. Um, you can see uh, on the screen that you might recognise some of your Victorian colleagues. We've got a wonderful Victorian team. Um, in that photo, there's Gina McKinnon and Rita Bryan and Sarah Hiley. Uh, some of you probably know those guys. So we've got an awesome Victorian team. Uh, shout out to you guys today as well. Uh, so Loop Australia is an Australian offshoot of the Loop UK. Um, Loop UK has been operating since 2013 uh, and testing drugs uh, at music festivals since about 2016. Uh, I want to just say too that where all of the, the volunteers in the loop are, are doing this in our personal capacity, uh, many of us do ha wear multiple hats and have different day jobs as well. So we're not representing our other organisations. And also we're not a political campaigning group, um, which I'll explain about that a little bit more in a sec. So what are we up to? Um, we're doing a whole bunch of things. The, the very simple thing that we're trying to do though is to develop a high quality professional drug checking service that's ready to operate as soon as the time is right. So 
we're, we're not act, acting as a directly advocacy type organization. We've established ourselves as a service provider to deliver drug checking when we are able to do so. And I think part of the reason for that is to show government how this can work and to show government what is the sustainable and viable organization that's able to deliver uh, actual drug checking services uh, when, we're, when we're able to do that. Um, we've been employing and training volunteers across the three states. Um, we've so far recruited and trained in total about 150 uh, chemists and health professionals uh, who are interested in service delivery. Um, we've also been able to receive philanthropic support, which has allowed us to purchase a full lab. So we've got um, a UV Viz, we've got a FTIR um, and all of the other lab consumables. Um, we've got iPads, we've got everything ready to go, basically. So we know that uh, the policy environment we're in is obviously complicated, uh, but we also know that, you know, drug policy moves really, really slowly, but then it also moves really quickly. And we basically need to be ready to, for when those little policy windows open, because there are particular alignments that occur. And uh, the policy window concept, some of you are probably familiar with, where the stars align and drug policy reform is suddenly possible. Uh, in an environment where often it is not possible for long periods of time. So um, we've been at this for uh, since 2018 and we're not going away. So um, we're going to keep chipping away until we uh, make some more, uh, more progress. And we are making progress all the time. So we have just recently uh, won a grant to develop a drug checking service in New South Wales. Um, we partnered with some major organisations down there on that project and we're looking forward to getting that started. Um, we can't say too much more about that at this stage. We're still in the early stages of that, but we're definitely making progress uh, towards our goal. So that's the background of the loop, but let's get into the novel psychoactive substances. The first thing I want to talk about with when we talk about these drugs is the terminology, because this terminology is quite problematic. Um, I know the presentation is titled novel psychoactive substances or new psychoactive substances, but they're fairly problematic terms, really. I mean, these drugs used to be called designer drugs um, back in the 80s and the early 90s. They were called that because these were drugs that were designed to mimic the effects of other illegal drugs, which is why they call them designer drugs. It's not a not a great term though, um, because it's not or doesn't really describe exactly what they always are. Um, more recently, the next sort of three terms have become more common. So things like novel psychoactive substance or new psychoactive substance or emerging psychoactive substance, and then the acronyms. Of course, the AOD sector is just lost without acronyms. So NPS or EPS. Now, all, all three of those terms are problematic and they're problematic because at, at what point are these drugs not new anymore? Uh, I've noticed drugs being referred to as new that have been used for like at least 30 years and more. Um, there are sometimes plant-based drugs that have actually got thousands of years of use in different cultures, which get referred to as new because they're new to us white people, um, which is not a great term. So ultimately, I think that this terminology reflects the fact that we're, we're catching up with the, the fact that the, the drugs have changed and that the way drugs are discovered, marketed and sold to people has changed. But actually, it's, we should probably stop calling them new. They're just drugs. And drugs have changed, and they've changed forever. Um, and this category of NPS, EPS, whatever it is, is actually probably a little bit meaningless. Uh, underneath that, though, amongst the people we work with, amongst our clients, the terminology is also changing uh, and people use all sorts of different terms. And a lot of these are quite regionally specific. Um, I know that if you work in a community with lots of people from New Zealand, uh, the term party pills was quite common a few years ago. Some people refer to things like herbal highs or legal highs or uh, my least favorite is synthetic drugs. Um, they're all synthetic except for the ones that are plants. Uh, so that's a very unsatisfying term. But I think one of the difficulties we've got is a bit of a gap in the in terminology and understanding what our clients are talking about at some points because new slang terms, uh, new brand names of drugs that we're unfamiliar with. Uh, and so we've, in, in a lot of senses, we've got to change the way we do some of our assessments and talk with our clients uh, and, and try to understand what, uh, exactly what drugs are we talking about uh, in this area. Now, before I go through like what are some of these current you know, new drugs that are appearing, uh, it's important, I think, to go back and look at some of the history of some of the other rec recent-ish 
new drugs that have come from obscurity to mass popularity and, and track the evolution of, and let's track the evolution of MDMA, which is a great sort of case study in a drug going from obscurity uh, through to mass popularity. So MDMA really emerged as a, um, a replacement for MDA. So MDA, methylene dioxyamphetamine, uh, is a very much like MDMA, but a bit longer acting, a bit more hallucinogenic. And MDA uh, was sold as an appetite suppressant in the 60s with the brand name Ampodexamine. Um, it was also tested in the, the CIA's MK Ultra program, used MDA as a, a way of assisting with interrogations. There's a famous image there from uh, one of the MK Ultra uh, trials on the screen. Because of that, though, MDA picked up a reputation as a fun recreational drug in the 60s, and, and there was a street sort of market for MDA. Um, MDA, MDA uh, was made illegal in the US in 1970. And coincidentally, or maybe not so coincidentally, as soon as MDA was scheduled in 1970, uh, illicit seizures of MDMA started turning up. So it, it sort of looks like MDMA emerged as a sort of common recreational drug, as a designer drug alternative to the now illegal MDA. So it's sort of interesting that we've got this fairly long history of um, prohibition uh, forcing innovation in drug markets and, and uh, prohibition sort of bringing new drugs to market uh, as others become restricted. And that pattern is something that's definitely continued to this day. And in fact, most of the sort of novel psychoactive substances or whatever that are out there, that the drive to generate these new drugs is not coming from people who take drugs. People who use drugs are not, you know, reporting that they are now bored with MDA or MDMA and they'd now like 800 new caffeinates. Um, that innovation is driven by the economics of prohibition, um, which we'll, we'll just sort of touch on throughout the presentation. Now, MDMA appeared in 1970, uh, once MDMA was made illegal. So you're probably familiar, Sasha Shulgin uh, rediscovered MDMA uh, in, in, in the 60s. And by the late 70s, Shulgin started to uh, produce MDMA and use it in underground psychotherapy. Um, Shulgin was pretty sure that MDMA had some potential uh, as a psychotherapeutic sort of agent. So Shulgin though tried to keep MDMA use underground. They tried to keep that relatively secret uh, because he was quite concerned about it becoming illegal like LSD and the other psychedelics. So our MDMA was sort of kept a little bit underground, although, you know, word eventually gets round. And by the early eighties, MDMA started to be sold as press tablets, it got branded as ecstasy, uh, and then the moral panic started after that. So it was MDMA was made illegal uh, from the mid eighties. The media um, went crazy about it. The media loves these stories. Uh, in many ways, this media moral panic actually advertises the drugs and makes them seem a lot more exciting. Uh, so there was all kinds of media, media panic happening all around the world, including in Australia. Um, it's then it's made illegal. It was a Schedule Two initially uh, in some parts of Australia. Then um, in recently made even more illegal. Um, and then the rates of use just continue to increase. So in Australia, our rates of MDMA use in the population probably peaked uh, in terms of recent use. It probably peaked around the mid 2008 2010. Uh, we hit like quite high levels of use in the population. Um, that's some of the lifetime data there. Uh, of MDMA. You can see most recently, 2016 household survey, about a quarter of people aged 30 to 39 have ever used MDMA. So quite high rate of population use there. So essentially it's 40 year curve, 40 years it took for MDMA to go from a very obscure drug replacing MDA, MDA right through to being widely available in the community. Everyone who wants it uh, can get it and can use it if they want to. So essentially, there's a lovely collage of ecstasy tablets. Um, essentially, what, what's happened though, is that curve that MDMA went through, that 40 year process of obscurity to popularity has now shrunk. And it's now shrunk down to, in some cases, a matter of weeks that a new drug can be discovered. It can be marketed off, usually online. Um, word spreads of its, of its availability online. People start ordering it and purchasing it. People start talking about the effects online. Um, in some cases, it builds up either a really positive reputation or a negative reputation. More people use it. 
uh, and then we move on to the next one. Uh, either, either through legislation, actually trying to catch up with different drugs, uh, but I think largely we're also driven globally by sort of global prohibition as well, so that even the laws that we implement here in Australia um, are not, not necessarily uh, as sort of important as the global legal framework behind a whole bunch of these drugs continuing to appear. So there's a lovely graph, a uh, lovely image for you, a Venn diagram uh, with all of the different drugs uh, available. It's a beautiful little image that just shows you uh, some of the new world of drugs. And I love this graphic just because it gives you a bit more of a complicated image of the ways all of these different drugs sort of work. But I wanna just talk you through the, the process through which these drugs started to speed up, through which this development of new drugs started to really speed up. And, um, some of this story starts in the mid 90s. Uh, two things happened in the mid 90s. It was the publication of PCAL and TCAL, and these are uh, authored by uh, Sasha Shulgin and his wife, Ann, Ann Shulgin. Um, now, both of these, PCAL stands for phenethylamines I have known and loved, and TCAL stands for tryptamines I have known and loved. And in each of these books, uh, Shulgin and his wife synthesized a different chemical. They described the synthesis and then they consumed the different drugs. And they'd start at a low dose and gradually escalate until something psychoactive happened. Um, they invented the Shulgin rating scale, which is a five star rating scale for each of the compounds. And a five star Shulgin compound would be one that produced a religious or mystical experience. Uh, a one star Shulgin compound would be something that had some negative effects or side effects, whatever. So, the, um, Shulgin published the two books. At, at the same time, though, the internet was emerging, and the internet is a great way of accessing illicit information, and drug information is one of those topics on particularly the early internet that was extremely popular. It gave access to information that we couldn't otherwise get our hands on, and copies of, of things like PCAL, TCAL uh, became quite popular. Uh, here's a list of the chemicals within uh, TCAL. Uh, these are all of the tryptamines. And so these include drugs like uh, DMT that's found in ayahuasca. Um, LSD is a complex tryptamine. There's a few others in there as well. Some of these are naturally occurring. Uh, some of them are not. They're mostly hallucinogens. Uh, the PCAL list is even longer. This is the phenethylamines. Uh, a, a range of different compounds here. Um, some of the 2C hallucinogens here. Uh, etc. Most of these, a large chunk of these are also hallucinogenic and some stimulants as well. Uh, if we think about these as like sort of first generation phenethylamines, uh, what, what we've seen happen and one of the reasons that the growth in novel psychoactive substances has uh, went through sort of exponential growth was because some of these compounds, the analogs could be made of these compounds, which could in turn produce further analogs, which could in turn produce even more analogs. So that uh, some of these compounds, it really opened up new, um, even more different compounds. And so we, for the first probably decade or 15 years up until maybe the last five or six years, a lot of the, the compounds we were seeing coming through were sort of analogs of these analogs, these, some of the early Shulgin compounds. Uh, one of the first of these compounds that was being sold sort of legally, this is uh, an example from Germany. This is 2CB, which was being sold in Germany. Uh, it was being packaged as obviously an erotic enhancer called Erox. Um, you can see, you, hopefully you can see the dosage information there. Um, what's interesting here is that all of the correct information is on the packaging. Uh, they've described what's in it. They've given dosage information. Uh, they advise not to operate heavy machinery after consuming, uh, which is very helpful. Uh, they also advise not to be used by people who are pregnant, who have heart disease, etc. So 2CB is a, a hallucinogenic phenethylamine. Uh, it was also available in the illicit market here in Australia from at least the mid nineties onwards. Um, often sold as, a, as Nexus caps is one of the nicknames it had back in the nineties here. Uh, 2CB is a, a hallucinogen, as I said, it doesn't have too many really serious toxic side effects. Um, there weren't like huge numbers of deaths associated with 2CB. Uh, but the, the government at the time uh, in Germany and Belgium and some other European countries uh, decided to make 2CB illegal, uh, mostly because there was just concern about a psychoactive drug being sold in shops, not necessarily relating to any harms in particular. But once 2CB was made illegal, almost immediately the next compound along came out, which was 2CT7. Uh, this is a close relative of 2CB, uh, also hallucinogenic phenethylamine, slightly longer acting, 
uh, and you know beginning this whole cat and mouse game that we've been playing ever since. And 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 you know essentially it's the same cat and mouse game that we played from MDA to MDMA. But what we saw is this real speeding up of these new products coming out from this time onwards. Now, 2CT7, this, is, this product was being sold in the Netherlands, so the dosage information there is all in Dutch. Uh, but again, correct dosage info on there, correct uh, um, precautionary information, all that kind of stuff. And again, not too many issues with these, this particular product in Europe. But what happened in the US around this time was that there were retailers appeared online that were selling 2CT7 in its pure form and its powdered form. And the active dose of 2CT7 is 10 milligrams, which is a very small amount of a compound. Um, and uh, in the US, uh, people were selling whole grams of it. And a young person who was uh, commonly known by his internet handle of Quicksilver, uh, snorted a few lines of 2CT7 powder and died from it, died from an overdose uh, of this particular drug. And his mum uh, set up, was like quite horrified that this substance was legally available on the internet. So she set up a foundation to educate uh, children and parents about whoops, uh, about the dangers of um, these new drugs. And unfortunately, that had a dual impact of popularizing the fact that there are all these new drugs available, which are legal and you can buy them with your credit card. And lots of the media reporting that happened around this time was exactly that. There were media articles that were, you know, sort of like having this sort of moral panic dimension about these dangerous new drugs, but also explaining in often very glowing terms the effects of the drugs and in some cases naming products and naming websites and really showing people where you can get them from. So it sort of led to this and the first kind of wave of online retailers supplying these particular drugs. So that kicked along for a while. We had these new sort of compounds popping out uh, for you know several new drugs per year, different online retailers uh, selling them, sometimes disguised as other products. Um, very famous early retailer known as Pond Man uh, was selling these products as outdoor pond cleaner. Uh, pond Man was selling a range of tryptamines and phenethylamines and eventually was arrested and put in jail. But Pond Man sort of started uh, this idea that you could mislabel products and you would sell them as other things. And it was then followed by methadrone as plant food, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the pattern was sort of set from the early 2000s. Um, now, this graph just shows you, this is from the European Monitoring Center, and the Europeans do really good research in this area, and they, they track the evolution of new drugs quite actively. Um, we're not so great at doing it here in Australia, so we tend to look at this European data. Um, you can see from 2005 to about 2010, you know, new substances coming along, but then this big explosion happened uh, from 2010 onwards. And it, it peaked into the 2014-15 with new drugs, uh, more than 100 new drugs being identified in 2014. And since then, it's sort of take, gone back down a little bit again. But it's interesting to reflect on, on why this sort of big explosion happened. And there's a number of different factors that, that explain why we sort of went from just a few new compounds to all of a sudden you know, really out of control numbers. Uh, one explanation is the global decline in MDMA purity. And this happened throughout you know, 2008, 2009, 2010. Uh, there was a real global shortage of MDMA precursors uh, around the world, which led to a decline in MDMA tablet purity. Uh, this graph here shows you, this is from the Netherlands, uh, and it shows you the different MDMA tablet content. And in 2010, you can see that most of the tablets contain less than 100 milligrams of MDMA. So, you know, less than an average adult dose. So the global MDMA shortage that occurred through those years, obviously the demand is still there for a drug like MDMA. And it was around this time that the cathinone type stimulants came in to really fill the gap. And mephedrone or MCAT, uh, was one that was being sold uh, initially as plant food from a particular retailer, and they were selling that even into Australia and other countries. Um, and that was really a, being a replacement for MDMA. Um, what's happened since then, though, is that the MD, MDMA synthesis has changed uh, to a new synthesis method, which has resulted in a massive increase in the purity of MDMA, uh, but we're still left with all of these new drugs. So let's have a look at what are some of the new drugs and what, what's actually out there. So this is from the European Monitoring Centre. This is only just released uh, last week. They've just put out their latest annual report. 
and they've looked at what are which are the most recent sort of new drugs and oh, these are these have been classified by the different types and you can see the cannabinoids obviously the largest group again um, part, part of the reason that this synthetic cannabinoids are uh, such a large group of compounds is because they're, some of them are quite chemically diverse from each other, whereas some of these other families, are, are the um, analogues are much more closely related, whereas amongst the cannabinoids, there's a fair bit more diversity, so there's a lot of them, but also the cathinone type stimulants being second most common. Uh, the category of other substances I find quite fascinating, um, what's in other substances, and there's a lot of them, so they should probably break that down a bit, but Within other substances, there are things like antipsychotic analogs. Uh, there are uh, performance and image enhancing drugs and some of the analogs in that category as well. It's actually a quite a diverse category within the so-called other substances. But um, I'm just going to take you through three of these families of drugs now, rather than go through the whole lot. I just want to walk you through a couple of them um, just to explain uh, really what, what some of these new new uh, drugs are and what some of the harms are as well and and where we've got into a bit of a pickle with a few of these drugs. So of these synthetic cannabis products uh, correctly known as synthetic cannabinoid receptor agonists or SCRAs, uh, the first one that became popular in Australia is one called Chronic and you're probably familiar with this. Chronic did become quite popular when it was first released and Chronic was being produced by a company in New Zealand and was later produced here in Australia as well. And it was being sold as a potent herbal incense. And the difference here uh, with Chronic, unlike those previous examples of, of Blue Mystic and that Aerox 2CB powder, is that Chronic was uh, being mis deliberately mislabeled. Uh, it was being sold as a potent herbal incense. And some of the marketing around Chronic was that it was actually a combination of herbs that together created a cannabis-like effect. So it was a deliberately misleading sort of marketing ploy to make people feel that this was a safe herbal alternative to cannabis. Um, it did mean that for, for a fair period of time, there, there were people who believed that. And I know uh, of people working in, when I was working in drug treatment area, we did have people who were uh, quitting cannabis to use chronic and thinking that this was a safer herbal alternative to cannabis and in some ways sort of a step down from cannabis smoking and therefore safer. Actually, it's much, much more dangerous than regular whole plant cannabis. Uh, but the chem chemical inside Chronic is a drug called JWH018. Uh, it doesn't even have a proper name. It's just got its research chemical name. Um, the JWH refers to the inventor, whose name is John W. Huffman. And this was the 18th uh, compound that he had worked on uh, when he was working through a whole series of cannabinoid receptor agonists. So John Huffman, he was doing research on cannabis uh, receptor agonists, looking, looking at researching the endocannabinoid system. So as a part of doing that research, obviously wanting to create agonists that will bind really tightly to those cannabinoid receptor sites so that they can do different types of studies to look at, at where those receptor sites might be located and what some of the effects of those, uh, those might be. Um, now, he's obviously very horrified that his chemicals turned up on the illicit market because he, he was quite freaked out that that ever happened. Um, what he was just publishing like any other uh, researcher would do, uh, what he didn't sort of realise was that you could, but anyone could pick up any of his publications and go to a chemical company uh, located in various countries around the world, and those companies would make you a chemical on consignment. So you could just request any compound you like, and the uh, company would just would manufacture it for you. Um, and that's what happened with JWH018. That's how it sort of emerged. It it went from you know a re research setting uh, with a very specific purpose to sort of moving out into the illicit market. Now again, if you reflect back on on MDMA's emergence. Uh, Sasha Shulgin and his colleagues were able to keep it a secret and use it in underground psychotherapy for a number of years, but that keeping things a secret is not possible anymore, and that is really why some of these drugs sort of leak out from, uh, in some cases, re research settings into the general public uh, really, really quickly. Uh, so this particular substance, Chronic, was um, uh, very popular in mining communities or anywhere where people were uh, being urine drug tested for work or if they were on probation or parole. So there was a very particular market for Chronic. Uh, part of the reason for that too is that the actual effects are not much fun and most people who used it in the different research that has been published uh, would report that they would much prefer to use regular old-fashioned whole plant cannabis. 
Now, the, the people who manufactured Chronic, they had just copied off uh, this German product, Spice. Uh, so this one, this was the very first of the synthetic cannabinoids being sold anywhere in the world. And you can see there, it actually looks a little bit like cannabis. It's a green herbal material, but it really, it's just a green herbal material with the synthetic cannabis product applied to it. Um, so I've got some pictures here to show you uh, how you make a synthetic cannabinoid. Now, they're very, very simple. This is a little jar of acetone. Um, someone would then apply some synthetic cannabinoid powder to it, purchased online from overseas somewhere, and then mix uh, some kind of herbal material. And in this case, this is tobacco, but really any herb. So it could be parsley or anything at all. That um, material is then poured out into a tray and the acetone evaporates off. And it evaporates and leaves the herbal material impregnated with the chemical. So it's very simple to manufacture, very simple to just get a herb and you know add some synthetic cannabinoids to it. Uh, people might also uh, apply flavorings to it at this point or various other sorts of things as well. Now, this manufacturing process, obviously not super scientific, um, not super great quality control either. Um, if too much of the chemical is applied to the plant material and that's put into a bag, you might find that the, the crystals of the chemical appear on the outside of the plant and gather in the bottom of the bag. So we did have reports at the time where, you know, people might've purchased a, a bag of synthetic cannabis and smoke most of it without too many concerns, but get to the bottom of the bag where the crystal has sort of concentrated and then have the overdose at the, in the bottom of the bag. Um, and that is just to do with this sort of manufacturing process that they've used just by simply impregnating a herb uh, with a chemical like that. Um, here's some images of, of the different products. And I think once people realized how simple it is to make your own synthetic cannabis, there was no need to purchase chronic. Um, anyone with a laser printer uh, and a catchy name could make their own and sell their own. And so we saw uh, across Australia, particularly in Queensland, I have to say, because of our mining communities, uh, we saw a bunch of entrepreneurs appear and start producing synthetic cannabinoids in the back shed quite literally. Um, uh, this little image on the right, the centometer, that's a real photo from a herbal high shop on the Gold Coast. Um, centometer is referring to how strong the herbal incense smells, if wink, wink. Uh, so the level 10 scent is the very strong smelling product, if you know what I mean. Um, but this was a, a retailing, a real retail example of how the products um, were being sold. And this was, I should say too, this was, that image is taken after these drugs were made quite illegal, uh, but this is herbal incense. So therefore not for human consumption and maybe we can dodge it and get away with that. Um, just, to, just a little story of the manufacturing process as well. Uh, we did have a few deaths here in Queensland from synthetic cannabinoids, uh, which resulted in a police operation to determine you know, where they're being manufactured. Uh, they found a tin shed at, at Toowoomba with a couple of guys who were producing synthetic cannabinoids with a cement mixer at the back, a cement mixer shoveling uh, herbal product into it along with synthetic uh, cannabinoid powder. Uh, so, you know, not great quality control but, and bulk scale, but they were charged and, and taken to prison. Um, they weren't using any PPE though. And the story goes that one of those guys apparently still has got a rash to this day uh, from his high level exposure to all of those chemicals. So um, they're, you know, obviously quite toxic. The other thing I'll mention on the synthetic cannabinoid receptor agonists uh, have other e-liquids as well. And obviously there's a big upswing in vaping occurring amongst young people at the moment. The vast majority of that is nicotine liquids or flavored liquids. Um, I don't think we've got a significant problem with uh, novel psychoactive substance in e-liquids um, just yet, but there definitely are examples of, of e-liquids designed for vaping that contain these kinds of, of, of chemicals. And um, this one I just found on the internet the other day, I was preparing this presentation and just dug around and found an online retailer selling chronic e-liquid for nearly 70 bucks for 10 mils, um, made in Australia, nicotine free. Um, this is most likely one of the newer synthetic cannabinoid receptor agonists as well. So there's these these products, the SCRAs have been around long enough now for there to be some good research into what they do and what they're capable of. And it is very clear that they are way more dangerous than regular old fashioned cannabis um, could ever be. They produce a range of effects well outside anything you would expect from regular old fashioned cannabis. 
Uh, this article I found here does a very nice little summary um, of the major sort of families of risk factors which can occur. Um, things like neurological risks, including stroke and seizures. Um, that's definitely something that I've seen occurring and, and seen, we've had a few cases now of young people using synthetic cannabinoids, um, inducing seizures, which have been very hard to control. And, and uh, in some cases, continuing to have seizures for like several hours after consuming the substance and quite difficult to control that as well. Uh, a whole range of psychiatric risks, um, uh, psychosis being one, uh, and in some of the psychotic features are, are a, a little unique as well. Um, a couple of, we had, there was a particular set of synthetic cannabinoids circulating uh, near where I work a couple of years ago, which produced a very strange set of psychotic symptoms. And we had about three young people hospitalized, all unconnected from each other in the mental health unit, but all three of them had that um, uh, a particular symptom, which has got a name in it for it, which I can't remember. It's sometimes seen in dementia patients and stroke victims where uh, a person believes all of their loved ones have been kidnapped and replaced by imposters, uh, which is obviously very distressing for the person and their family. Uh, but we had a little cluster um, of three in, in mental health units in Brisbane, all uh, following consumption of synthetic cannabinoid. Uh, so very strange um, sort of symptom that you would just not really seen that happen before. Uh, but a range of sort of psychiatric risks associated with these drugs. Um, more recently, I think, and, and amongst the fatalities that have occurred, it's it, it, it does, these drugs do appear to have some pretty significant cardiac risks as well. Uh, so obviously increasing the heart rate, but there's been a bunch of myocardial infarctions and sudden cardiac death associated with these drugs. But most of the deaths associated with synthetic cannabinoids are sudden cardiac death. Um, there's also been some clusters of acute kidney injury as well. Uh, this one occurred mostly in the US uh, from 2013 to 2014. Since then, there's been a few little spates of it as well. Uh, uh, again, very unusual, um, not something that we would expect to see uh, with regular old fashioned cannabis, but it commenced with people presenting to EDs in the US uh, with nausea and vomiting. And on investigation, they found out that they had acute kidney injury. Uh, it, it seemed like the, the synthetic cannabinoids were restricting blood supply to their kidneys. And that was what was uh, causing this kidney injury. I uh, don't think any of the ca those cases died, but they were quite unwell and also took them a while to get diagnosed as well because it's such an unusual presentation and these drugs being so new, like no one would have guessed that that would be a thing. Uh, so just in a sort of example of some of the really strange effects that these drugs can produce. Um, this one too, this was published last year. It's an Australian study that looked at the synthetic cannabinoid receptor deaths. Uh, quite an interesting one because it went back, it used the National Coronial Info System to try and track the, the deaths from these drugs. They found 55 cases. Uh, this could be some underreporting. The NCIS isn't always super accurate. It does, it does rely on, on the correct data being input. So maybe slightly underreported. Um, most of the deaths they refer to as accidental toxicity. But amongst those deaths, what they found that was that there was a high representation in the older males within the group and cardiovascular disease was, was uh, seen in, in a, a large chunk of them as well. So it seemed like the risk of cardiac death was increased by age and having some pre-existing cardiovascular disease. And many of those people would not have known that they had that though. It wasn't like these were people who were, you know, being treated for cardiac, uh, any cardiac disease or whatever, but um, their use of synthetic cannabis had uh, resulted in, in, in the majority of those cases, sudden collapse. And and death. And so we're definitely aware of a range of those cases. And I know there's definitely been further cases since 2017 uh, as well. So that's synthetic cannabinoid receptor agonist, not much fun. Um, I will just mention too that because this is not a particularly fun drug, um, what, what's happened with these drugs, the synthetic cannabinoids, particularly elsewhere in the world and also in Australia, is that over time, the only people who are left using this particular substance are generally people who don't have access to other drugs. It tends to be some of our most disadvantaged people in our community. Um, I know for us here in Queensland, that's ended up being in some remote Aboriginal communities, also amongst homeless people, uh, amongst people in prison or recently released or engaged in the criminal justice system as well. Uh, they're people who, who uh, I think are ending up using this substance because of the, their difficulties accessing other drugs uh, and the, the situations they're in in their lives. So it's, it's worth keeping in mind the ways that some of these substances do em, en, en, end up impacting some of the most vulnerable people uh, in our community. 
The next set of compounds I want to talk to you about is benzodiazepines, which many of you will be familiar with working in AOD. Very offensive ad. Um, this is a real ad from the 1960s uh, for uh, oxazepam or serapax as we often know it. Um, so benzos have been around for a long time. We're very familiar with them. Uh, they were introduced in the 1960s as a non-addictive and safer alternative to barbiturates, um, which they are definitely not non-addictive, marginally safer than barbiturates. But they were originally marketed particularly towards women, in this case, the housewife sort of scenario. Um, now, we've, we're familiar with the dependence that benzos can induce uh, and how difficult that can be to manage. So what's um, been appearing over the last few years is we've had a real, we, there's always a benzo which has been misused. Um, there's, you know, we've been through rohypnol, temazepam gel caps, the little green footies back in the early 2000s. Um, and more recently, Xanax has been the one. Now, Xanax or Al, Xanax, Alprazolam, Xanax, the brand name for the Pfizer product. Um, Xanax was made a schedule eight drug in Australia. Uh, back in the end of 2017, uh, due to the misuse of Xanax. When that happened, when that decision was made by the TGA, Pfizer, who produced brand name Xanax, the brand name Xanax bars, removed Xanax from the market in Australia because they figured that they're not going to be selling much more of it anymore. Uh, and so we, the actual brand name Xanax has disappeared from Australian pharmacies from probably about 2018. There might have still been a bit in stock after that. But we started getting reports uh, in my day job of young people using Xanax uh, probably about two years ago, um, which we were a bit con uh, confused about because like, where are they getting it from? Like, is it still people prescribing it? But even if there was, they can't get the actual brain name Xanax. So um, we did have a few youth workers send us photographs of these, of these tablets and I, we identified that they are counterfeit Xanax, they're fake. Um, they're barely close to the real thing. But the pill presses are not as uniform. They're not as neatly pressed. So um, counterfeit Xanax has become a very significant thing. Um, I'll show you a couple of photos as well as we go. Oh, this is one. So Karma, K-A-L-M-A. Karma is one that is still sold in Australia. Um, this is a, th this um, particular version of Karma, you can see it's got a brand name on it, which is itself not sold in Australia, but Karma, there's a version of Karma produced by Alpha Farm here in Australia, uh, which is a generic version. Um, so some of these counterfeits have included counterfeit bottles. In this case, that's a pretty good counterfeit, like the only difference is the tiny little logo on there. There's other versions of the Alpha Farm uh, Karma product where they actually misspelled Alpha Farm. They left the H out of Alpha Farm. If you're going to go to all this trouble of pressing tablets that look the same, at least spell it right on the bottle. Um, but this um, these, uh, Karma uh, actually does not contain Alprazolam. In fact, most of the illicit Xanax or the counterfeit Xanax that's been out there uh, contains other benzos, other, other novel benzos. And uh, there's a few common ones. And, and this example from New South Wales is of uh, the benzos so it has a lamb. It has a lamb is a, a benzo which is used in some countries around the world. It's used in, I think, Italy and Japan. It's, it's prescribed for anxiety. Um, it's relatively similar, similar to alprazolam in, in sort of dosage and half-life. It's not, not too different. Uh, in this case, you can see the my, these are some examples of myelin A4 uh, with the little X score on it. That, so myelin A4, that's an American product. We've never had myelin branded Alprazolam licensed for sale in Australia. So anyone who encounters Mylan A4s are definitely counterfeits. Um, but that's some examples of, uh, from New South Wales of the counterfeit, uh, the counterfeit Xanax products. Now amongst, I mentioned there's a couple of other ones. There's probably three major types of novel benzos that are being sold as, as Xanax. Although not always, there's some other, other counterfeit benzos out there as well. There's counterfeit uh, Valium or Dazepam as well. But I think uh, we've mostly seen counterfeit Xanax uh, being the most common one. And it's either been Itazolam, but more recently flu Alprazolam, so close relative of Alprazolam, and flu Bromazolam as well. Uh, these um these particular other benzos, well, Itazolam is quite similar to Alpraz in its onset and duration sort of half-life. Um, the uh, flu alprazolam is a little bit different and much longer acting. And so dose for dose also quite a bit stronger than regular alprazolam. Um, now we've started to encounter particularly younger people 
Uh, I'm not exactly sure why that is, but we've seen it mostly in under 18s. We actually haven't seen the counterfeit benzos here in Queensland anyway. We have not seen this as much in our uh, regular sort of injecting drug using cohort or our opioid using uh, uh, people. It's been much more in school age young people uh, purchasing it from their friends at school as well. Uh, we think that some of these counterfeit benzos are being pressed here in Australia. So the powder is being imported from overseas and then pressed into tablets um, locally uh, and then on distributed and in, on, on a fairly large scale as well. Uh, enough that we've started to see benzo dependence emerging in, in young people as well, uh, which is definitely not something we're used to seeing. Like often we think of benzo dependence as, as being generally amongst either more elderly people or amongst people who use other drugs, particularly opioids, but um, not so much in, in younger people who in, in, in many cases don't use too many other drugs as well. So some of that is because I think that the, uh, the duration and effect is longer than the regular alprazolam. Uh, people can develop dependence on some of these novel benzos without using it every single day because the, the half-life is long enough that they may have some in their system uh, all the time, even when they're only using every second or every third day. So we have sort of seen dependence starting to kick off amongst some of these, uh, these chemicals as well. One of the real challenges with this now though, is that uh, how do we manage a, a detox in someone using a novel benzo when we don't know what the real doses are? And I know that there is some data from Queensland that's been publicly released. And I've got a link for you at the end of the presentation, uh, looking specifically at novel benzos and fake Xanax in particular, and, and looking at the dosages and what's in them. Uh, what we've been finding is that it's almost always higher dose than, than a two milligram Xanax equivalent. So one of the takeaway messages is that if you've got clients using these counterfeit benzos, we do have to make an assumption that the doses and the half-life, et cetera, is higher and longer than what the number of tablets they're taking might reveal to us. So another little tip if you've got clients that are using these sort of counterfeit benzos is you can just jump onto MIMS, uh, MIMS online if you've got access. Uh, we're just about to publish a little fact sheet as well. So. Uh, and my other day job around this topic. But if you have a look at the commonly available benzos that are prescribed in Australia, um, you'll find that a lot of what our clients are using are not even on the list. And so if they are not even available for prescription in Australia, you can pretty much assume it's a counterfeit benzo. Um, the last sort of category I wanted to talk about are the, are the, the so-called cathinones. Um, this one here is the first of them, the so-called bath salts, pure ivory novelty collector's item. You can see in very small print there, MDPV, uh, that's the chemical inside the bath salt. This bears no relationship to bath salts at all. It was just a fake name to, in order to sell it. Uh, so yeah, there's absolutely no bath salts uh, contained there. But this cathinone stimulant is from the family uh, related to CAT or cathodulis and naturally occurring stimulant that's used in northeastern Africa and chewed a little bit like coca leaf for a mild sort of stimulant effect. Um, cathinone in the cat plant is a stimulant like methamphetamine. It works on dopamine. And so it then has many of the same effects that you'd expect from methamphetamine. And that includes things like dependence where people you know, can't stop using and use more than they intend to, uh, but it also can induce psychotic symptoms as well. And the psychosis from cat in particular uh, looks just like meth psychosis. So persecutory paranoia is one of the main features. Uh, now, this family of cathinones, though, is a very large family. And these, uh, th this is just a sample. I mean, there is many, many more than this that are available. But the cathinones fall along a bit of a spectrum. And if you think about serotonin agents at one end and dopamine agents on the other, um, MDMA ecstasy-like at this end, and then methamphetamine-like at that end, uh, the cathinones all fall somewhere along that spectrum. So mephedrone, for example, probably more at the serotonin MDMA end, whereas something like uh, APVP, much more at the methamphetamine end. Now, that's important because with the more serotonergic you get, the more likely you'll have things like serotonin toxicity as the major risk, but you may not see things like dependence. And that's because of the tolerance that is induced from those serotonergic agents. The other end of the spectrum, the dopaminergic agents, the, the more dopamine end, um, you'll see it much more like methamphetamine. So you won't see serotonin toxicity, but you'll see dependence and you'll see things like psychosis as well, uh, where people don't sleep. We're going through cycles of every season, there's a new crappy cathinone available. Um, we've cycled through several of them now. 
Um, this is an example of an alert from the loop in the UK from a couple of years ago regarding N-ethylpentylone. Um, N-ethylpentylone is currently circulating here in Australia. It's a very crappy cathinone. Uh, each redose uh, extends the half-life. So if people take a couple of doses, then they can be awake for two and three days at a time. So that's another example of one of the alerts. And um, we recently had an alert out on this one. Uh, this one came out in Victoria in December, um, and this was N-ethylpentylone identified in cocaine. So active dose of N-ethylpentylone is 10 to 20 milligrams. I imagine people racking up a few lines thinking that it's cocaine. Um, and very quickly, they will not be able to sleep for a very long period of time. So just to wrap up, I wanted to just take you right back to one final little case study. Um, this is on the Gold Coast back in 2016. We had a, a cluster of severe overdoses and one death uh, across the entertainment precinct in the Gold Coast. Uh, an ambulance officer, I think, described it as probably flacca, which is helpfully referred to as the zombie drug. This started uh, what you may remember as the great zombie drug hysteria of 2016, uh, where the media reporting uh, became quite out of control zombie drugs are coming to kill us all. Um, some very unhelpful media reporting, uh, referring to this drug as the zombie drug. Uh, a massive policing response to that. In fact, the Triple C used coercive hearing powers on all of the people who were involved in the overdose outbreak, which is a very unhelpful response for people who have called ambulances for their severe medical emergency. Um, we got media filming people who were overdosing and filming the ambulance response and posting the videos into media articles uh, without any uh, attempt to disguise any of the poor people involved in this case. Uh, there were several media reports of that nature. Um, filming, uh, this occurred then over several days. We had then multiple overdoses into the following week from this drug, uh, the zombie drug. And then, oh, look, it's actually not really a zombie drug. It's bad trips, which is, they, as the media reported, a combination of LSD and MDMA known as NBOM. Super, super unhelpful. Um, and an example of what happens when we don't have good information about the drugs that are out there and the void is filled by well-meaning people who actually don't really know anything about the drugs that they're talking about. Um, we lost an opportunity for some useful harm reduction. Um, we, it actually took a very long time to find out through any legitimate means what was the actual substance involved in these cases. Um, now that was 2016, just interestingly in September last year, uh, and, and a alert came out for exactly the same substance involved in that cluster of overdoses, which was 4-fluoroamphetamine and 2,5-CN bone. Now, this particular combination, it's a very unusual combination. Um, nobody would generally enjoy that combo at all. It would be almost impossible for someone to have a fun night out on that particular combo because of the way that they interact. Now, many of you in Victoria will be aware of this combo because it's actually the same combination that led to five deaths uh, in Victoria. Only a few months after the original Gold Coast cluster, there was five overdose deaths in Victoria, several hospitalizations across the nightclub uh, precinct in one particular weekend, uh, which resulted in a coronial inquiry uh, that has actually only very recently wrapped up. Uh, and that coronial inquiry has recommended the introduction of drug checking uh, in order to get this information out to people who need it. Now, one of the real tragedies of this particular case is that we know 2,5-CM bone is significantly more potent when it is snorted. Most of the fatalities involve people who snorted it. If we had have known that this was the compound involved, we could have very simply got some good simple harm reduction information out to the people who needed it. And it, it, simple advice like don't snort your caps um, would have been a really, really useful thing to know at this time. Um, this information around what was in this compound was held by police departments and it was withheld from the public and that led to deaths all over the place. And that's a really unethical position, uh, I think, to for have, have actual authorities know that there is this particular substance out there and the information that we know can actually reduce the risk is being withheld from the public. So this coronial inquiry that's been held in Victoria is quite significant in that it has addressed this problem and it has looked very deep in a lot of detail about it and has recommended uh, drug checking as an intervention to try and get this information out there. Um, rather than wait for people to rock up to hospital and then work out, I wonder what put them in there. Wouldn't it be nice if we could test these drugs in advance? and find out what's out there and let people know before they end up in our emergency departments. 
So that's where I wanted to wrap up. Um, the last thing I wanted to say is I do have to give us, I do have to rattle the charity team because the Loop Australia is a completely unfunded organisation. We are not anticipating that governments will be rushing to fund us and our work. Uh, I think we need to do this ourselves and we need to, as a sector and as a community, step up and fill the void. And that's really what we've been trying to do with the Loop Australia. So we've got a crowdfunder running at the moment to try and keep the doors open and to keep our work happening, uh, to keep our equipment running and keep us out there and pushing. So uh, we would very much appreciate any donations at all. Uh, so you can, there's our crowdfunder. You can jump on our website, theloop.org.au, if you'd like to make a donation and we would appreciate that very much. Um, and just lastly, there's a bit of additional info. I'm happy to share the slides, uh, so don't madly scramble this all down, but there's a few other webinars there I wanted to share. Excellent webinar on synthetic cannabis with Sam Bannister and Shane Dark. Um, also excellent webinar on designer benzos, particularly fake Xanax. Uh, and then very lastly, a really nice one from Victoria as well. So that's all I had time for. And there is probably a little bit of time for questions. Well done, Cam, thank you, great breadth and depth, everything from um, covering moral panics to psychopharmacology uh, uh, and an amazing capacity to uh, pronounce the names of all the different substances. So well done. Uh, let me uh, point to a couple uh, around detoxes in particular. Daniel Elfringham has noted that the patients that he sees most recently in EDs are really or so addicted to synthetic cannabis that they can't stop. The products that they are using seem to be so potent but so strong acting that they experience significant withdrawal in, all, uh, in particular agitation that they need to smoke 24-7 in order to be able to sleep and function. Could you make a, do you have a response to that, including thinking about detoxing with and withdrawal with the substances that you've touched on? Yeah, great, great question. Um, there have now been some published case reports on exactly this, because it's definitely been noted that there is a, a fairly significant withdrawal syndrome amongst some of these compounds. Uh, if I don't have the names of the articles at hand, but there definitely are some synthetic cannabis uh, withdrawal um, articles have been published. So there have been case series published, which have described some of the presentations and some of the management approaches. Uh, I don't think it's got to the point where there's a very, very clear set of, of uh, withdrawal management guidelines around that though, but there are definitely case series reports which have been published. So if you have a dig around uh, in the academic literature, you'll find those. The, the, the difficulty is though that uh, the compounds have been changing over time. So you may find articles talking about synthetic cannabinoid withdrawal from like five or six years ago. I would ignore those ones because we're probably onto more recent compounds. So when you're searching for information on this, particularly synthetic cannabinoids, uh, focus on, on articles from like probably the last two years would be the best, uh, the closest you'll get to what, whatever it is that's in these products we're seeing now at the moment. Thanks, Cam. Uh, Rita, uh, notes that uh, in Victoria we have a blanket psychoactive substances ban from around 2015 from her memory. Are they still legally sold over the counter in Queensland? No, we had a, a Queensland had a um, similar analog inverted commas analog act even earlier in 2012, zero impact, had absolutely zero impact. Um, we just had more uh, shops selling things disguised as herbal incense still. So people have been charged. Uh, there's one famous case here, though, in Queensland where a shop was raided and all the products seized and all of the products returned to the store uh, because they were uh, labelled as things like incense and the prosecution was found to be too complicated to undertake. So I think those laws have proven to be uh, in ineffective. That's been reinforced in the chat as well, Cam, by some of our attendees talking about the, the, the problems, in fact, with prohibition and uh, the extraordinary number of analog substances popping up. Where do yeah, you think, think um, sorry, the last question then, it looked like from the graph there was uh, the, the greatest proportion or incidence was in 2015. What's the future then for these substances? Uh, do we just keep, do they keep on developing them? Uh, and to what extent? I think yes, they do because um, technological innovation. We don't unwind. We don't unlearn technological innovation. I think what we've seen with some of the synthetic cannabinoids is that we've seen uh, 
some of the ones which were circulating a couple of years ago recirculating again, then disappearing and then coming back. So some of them are cycling through the market now. But I think that we're just going to see more and more and more of this. Like I definitely don't see it going away. I think the new world of drugs is just more and more uh, contamination, more and more uh, products being missold uh, as well. So yeah, I don't see it getting any better. Thanks, Cam. Uh, data, sources of data in Australia and uh, did, did your, one of your more brief last slides point to that? Um, a little bit. Yeah, we've, we're a bit shaky on the Australian data. Um, we don't get access very easily to the forensic data that police hold. Um, and I think that that's a real shame. So there's we, we're, there's a, a lot of work going on around the early warning system or prompt response network via NCRED. There's some great research happening at the moment to try and get that, that network together. And I think that will definitely help. Uh, get a channel for us to get some of this info out there because at the moment it sits all over the place and we don't have one kind of central place for it. So I think the NCRED prompt response network uh, sort of work will help to try and resolve that. Thanks, Cam. And I noticed that Thomas put in the chat in response to your question that it might have been called Capgrass syndrome, Capgrass syndrome. Oh, yes, that's it. Okay, yeah. well done, Thomas. Great pickup. So thank you. No, not a problem. All right, thank you. Cam for joining us. That was uh, really informative. Really appreciate you joining us. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you to Ed. Thank you to Julia in the background for all your support in putting this on. And thank you to everyone who's joined us today. Uh, there was an extraordinary amount of content uh, and really well presented. So thank you for joining us. Thank you to our presenters. And we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye-bye, everybody.